Now let's see what John saw. Having turned aside, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. Oh, his head and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it's been made to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun, shining in its strength. Wow. An amazing picture. And if someone tried to literally artistically paint this as some have tried to do, it's a frightening scene. Understand that John is being poetic. He is drawing a word picture here. He is showing us what Jesus looked like in the most powerful words that he can possibly pull together to give us a vision of what it was that he saw. What did he see? Back to verse 13. The Bible tells us, I saw one like a son of man clothed in a robe reaching to his feet. Jesus looks like a human being. You might want to jot a few of these things down. John looked and saw Jesus, and he just looked like a human being. Son of man. Son of man. Son of man. This was Jesus' favorite self-designation. As he preached, as he walked those three years that we have recorded in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus called himself over and over and over, Son of man. More than any other thing that he called himself, he said, Son of man. I'm a son of man. I'm like John, the fellow partaker. I'm in the flesh. I'm like you. I'm with you. I'm a son of man. That's absolutely amazing to me. With one significant exception, Jesus is the only person in the entire New Testament who called himself son of man. One other person did. But nobody else did. Just Jesus. And by the way, just consider this. When you think that God can't possibly understand the problems that you face, remember that he walked and breathed and lived in this world just like you. If you're feeling persecuted, if you feel alone, if you feel exiled on Patmos, hey, hey John, listen up, Jesus says, look at me. I'm the same guy. Do you remember walking the shores of Galilee together? Do you remember our journeys in the hills of Judea? Do you remember sitting out on the hillside when all those people gathered around and we fed them and you didn't think there was going to be enough fish? Do you remember? Remember me, John? I'm the same guy. Son of man. I'm God, but I am still the Jesus you knew so well. And John wrote, John 1.14, the word did become flesh and dwelt among us. And John, in, in John chapter 1, verse 14, said, and, and we saw his glory. And you go, yeah, I see. He saw his glory. Problem is, John wrote, we saw his glory way before this happened. Well, John, when did you see his glory? Flip in your Bible to Matthew 17. Matthew chapter 17. In verse 1, we see the story when John and Peter and James saw the glory saw the glory of Christ John uh, Matthew chapter 17 verse 1 six days later Jesus took with him Peter and James and John his brother and led them up on a high mountain by themselves and he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his garments became as white as light and behold Moses and Elijah appeared to them Talking with him. Now watch this. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll make three tabernacles here. One for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now pause for a moment. Consider this. Total side note. Peter recognized Elijah and Moses. He'd never seen Elijah and Moses before. These were prophets of the past. Several hundred years prior, longer in Moses' case, and he says, let's build these three little tabernacles, these tents, let, let's set them up. These little places of honor and worship for you and Elijah and Moses. He knew. How did he know? Same way I think you and I are going to know each other when we're in heaven. 
We will recognize each other. Paul says from now on we don't look at anybody in the flesh. We don't consider each other in the flesh. Interesting, but Peter knew it was Moses. He knew it was Elijah. And verse 5 says, while he was still speaking, or pulling his foot out of his mouth, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Not to Elijah. Not to Moses. You listen to Jesus. And when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. I mean, you know, this is the Galilean who went up a hill and came down a mountain. You know, you've heard the, the, the pun on that phrase. They go up a hill with Jesus like any other day. They're going to go off with Jesus and hang out. He's probably going to do some of that praying that he does so much. And we're just going to hang out and eat figs or something while we're waiting. And boom! This scene, Jesus is... They could hardly look at him. And out of the heaven, God begins to speak, and they're blown away. They are absolutely on their faces, terrified, the Bible says. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Get up, and do not be afraid. And lifting their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself, alone. I like that phrase. No one except Jesus himself. The Son of Man. The Son of Man. It, it was just Jesus. Again, you may ask, well, isn't there room for more religions? Isn't there room for all these different paths leading down into one great final culmination, oh, maybe in the Valley of Megiddo? <laughs> isn't there room for all these different beliefs? There's no one except Jesus. No one except Jesus. God said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And in verse 9 he says, as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man... Son of Man has risen from the dead. And so John holds on to this vision, this picture. Jesus glorified. And later he would write, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. I can tell you the story. I was on the mountain. I was freaking out with Peter and James. Peter actually went down first. He won't tell you that, but I'll tell you. I was standing a little longer than Peter. But we all were scared to death by this scene of the Son of Man. It was Jesus' favorite personal designation. But Son of Man, listen to this was also a powerful prophetic designation. Matthew chapter 16, verse 28, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Who is He talking about? John. John, 100 years old, the longest living apostle, saw Jesus coming in His kingdom in the vision of the Revelation. He saw one like a son of man. Back in Revelation. You can flip back over there. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 verse 13 tells us. Daniel writes, I kept looking in the night visions. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he gave up to the Ancient of Days. He came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him every dominion and glory and, and a kingdom that all the peoples... Nations and men of every language might serve Him. His dominion, whose dominion? The Son of Man's. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Now put yourself in the sandals of the disciples who would heard Jesus call Himself over and over and over, Son of Man. These Jewish boys would be listening and seeing that human designation, that personal designation, but also going, wait a minute, isn't there something in the Old Testament about a son of man who's given all power and glory? And Is Jesus talking about that? Is, is that Jesus? Could he be the same prophetic son of man? But the apostles, save John, did not see the rest of the story come to pass. John did. The Jesus who called himself Son of Man. John saw him transfigured gloriously on the mountain. He is the one and the same Son of Man Daniel spoke about, and his kingdom is coming. Verse 13, going back, tells us, One like a Son of Man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. Those of you who have studied through Exodus with us recently will recognize this as the clothing worn by the high priest. Jesus was not only looking like a human, he also looks like the high priest. The high priest. The robe and sash combination, a picture of what the high priest wore. 
Hebrews chapter 5 verse 1 says, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men and things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. And he can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself also is beset with weakness. And because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins as for the people but also for himself. But Jesus, unlike all the other high priests, who were weak and failing like all the humans that they served, Jesus did something no other high priest could do. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 11 says every high priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. By the way, in the tabernacle, the one piece of furniture missing was a chair. Because the high priest was constantly on his feet. The priest working in the holy place was constantly doing his ministry. There was no time for sitting and relaxing in the tabernacle. The work had to be done. So it's significant when the Hebrew writer says, But Jesus, our high priest, offered that one sacrifice and took a seat. Why? Because he was done. There was no more work that needed to be done. It was taken care of. The golden sash, by the way, was normally worn around the waist. Now it's worn up around the chest, we're told. Why? It's bound around the heart of Jesus. A binding sash. It, it indicates, I think, restraint. Restraint for this high priest. What do you mean? The power of Jesus. The passion of Jesus. Restrained for a time. Holding himself back, literally, his heart. Holding himself back until he returns to take out the church. Wrapped around his heart. Jesus looks like the high priest because he gave the highest sacrifice himself. Continuing on, verse 14 says, His hair, his head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow. Number three, Jesus, he not only looks like a human, he not only looks like a high priest, he looks like an honorable king. An honorable king. He bears in this vision the wise face of a king like Solomon. Or better yet, the king of the ages, the ancient of days. Here is Jesus, this, this white hair, white like wool, like snow. He looks like the ancient of days. Listen to Daniel again speaking. Daniel chapter 7 verse 9 says, I watched as thrones were put in place, and the ancient one sat down to judge. His clothing was white as snow, and his hair like whitest wool. Same description. And now John looks at Jesus and says... He is, he is the Ancient of Days, this honorable king who we're looking at. Now, we just read a verse a few minutes ago from the same chapter. You might recall the Son of Man approaching the Ancient of Days on the throne. Here's a mind blower for you. Jesus, the Son of Man, Jesus, the Ancient of Days, Jesus approaching Jesus, God approaching God. What? We are looking into great eternal things here, gang. A God who defies definition. We can do our best. We can try and water down and just say, okay, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, as long as we keep them separate, we're okay. Until you get to chapter 1 and you read about the seven spirits before the throne and you go, ow, ow, I don't get it. Until you read in Daniel that the Son of Man, who we know is Jesus, who he called himself approaches the Ancient of Days on the throne, but now we see the description of the Ancient of Days fits Jesus too. Because He's God. Amen. He is God. We are looking at the glorified Christ, the way He really looks, and John is absolutely stunned. Well, going on. Oh, by the way, one other thing. John chapter 10, verse 30, if you need just a little more understanding of the relationship between Jesus and the Father, He says, I and the Father are one. We're the same guy. I have never said that Corey and I are one. He's my son. I'm his dad. We hang out together. We enjoy spending time together. Don't we? <laughs> yes, Dad. <laughs> but I don't say we're one. Because we're not. We're two. We love each other very much, but we're still two. The Father and I, Jesus says, are one. John 14, 9, Jesus says, He who has seen me... To see the Father. John, when you look at me and you see my head and my hair white like white wool like snow, <laughs> it's God. Ancient of days, same guy, same person, it's me. I am the Lord. Wow. 
By the way, if he is the Ancient of Days, do you think maybe he has a clue on how to go, how to handle what's going on in your life today? He's the Ancient of Days. He is always been, always will be. He knows how to handle what's happening today in your life. Psalm one thirty nine sixteen. David writes in your book, were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Ancient of days knows what's happening. Next time you have a hard day, and you find yourself saying, man, I didn't see that coming. Relax. Take heart. God saw it coming. The ancient of days knew what was headed your way. And chances are real good he prepared you in one way, shape, or form to deal with it. But he's done more, by the way, than just get you through the day. This honorable king's woolly, white, snowy hair reminds me of my very salvation. Isaiah 118, the Lord says, Come now and let us reason together. Though your sins are scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red, they will be crim- like crimson. They will be like wool. Like wool. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. Number four, Jesus looks like a hot-blooded prophet. He's got the fire in his eyes. He is, he is lit up. He's ready to go. John looks at his eyes and it's like, his eyes are on fire. He is hot for this prophecy. He is hot to be here. He, he is flamed up. I told you a few minutes ago that his favorite self-designation on earth was the Son of Man. But I also mentioned that one other person in the New Testament said that same thing. Want to know who it was? It was a guy named Stephen. Stephen. Acts chapter 7, the disciple Stephen. He wasn't even one of the apostles. He was actually one of seven men called upon to take care of some administrative stuff. Feeding of the, of the um, Greek widows and, and take care of some things in the, in the church, in the early church. Stephen, but man, this guy was on fire. This guy was prophetic. And he's in front of the critics and he was confounding them. And the Bible says in Acts 7 he was full of the Holy Spirit. And he proclaimed Christ before the Jewish Sanhedrin who had crucified Christ. And Acts chapter 7 verse 55 in a powerful scene says, Being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And the Jews went berserk and stoned him to death. In that moment. I saw the Son of Man. I see the Son of Man. Daniel, son of man. Jesus, who claimed to be the son of man. I see him. He's right there. And what's he doing? The Bible says he was standing. Wait a minute. We just read that when he finished the work, he sat down. Why is he standing? (laughs) I think he was cheering Stephen on. Go, Stephen. Man, this is a great sermon. Are you guys listening to this? This is awesome. All right, go. I'm with you. I'm standing. I'm cheering. Aaron's not the only male cheerleader. Cheering Stephen on right to his death. And I love Stephen's death. The picture of this martyrdom, the first Christian martyr, second, actually second one. Jesus was the first. But in this martyrdom, the Bible tells us after seeing Jesus, they they took him out. They began to stone him. And he looks up and he says, forgive him. Forgive him. They don't know what they're doing. Just like Jesus. And the Bible says he went to sleep. He fell asleep. And I think Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father is going, Go, Stephen. This is awesome. This is awesome. Come on home. Come on home. Relax. Go to sleep. This hot-blooded prophet. His eyes of fiery passion. The same passion that took him to the cross is alive in his eyes today, waiting to come get his bride. And when he looks at you and when he looks at me, especially in times of persecution, his eyes are on fire. And he's with you. And he is passionate for you. Jesus, this hot-blooded prophet. Verse 15, his feet. His feet were like burnished bronze when it's been made to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was shining like the sun shining in its strength. Number five, Jesus looks like the holy God. The holy God. In this amazing description in these last couple of verses, feet like burnished bronze. Bronze in the Bible indicates the authority to make righteous judgments. 
The altar of sacrifice was made of bronze. You may recall if you studied these things. And as in the bronze altar where judgment was rendered and sacrifices were made, Jesus' feet looked like burnished bronze. Well, where did they get burnished? Well, when did they get bronze? Well, I don't know if this was the exact time or place, but it reminds me of an interesting Old Testament story, Daniel chapter 3. Three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, get tossed into a fiery furnace. And in that furnace, they are supposed to burn alive. And Nebuchadnezzar, king at the time, says, Hey, check and see if they're fried. Look in there. And one of his henchmen looks inside the furnace and says, Oh, well, that's weird. They're not, they're not dead, Neb, Nebi, king, sir. They're not dead. They're walking around. How many guys did we throw in there? Because there were four. And he says in Daniel chapter 3 verse 25, Look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm and the appearance of the fourth was like the Son of God. Amen. That may have been where Jesus got his little foot tan. Right there. <laughs> Feet of burnished bronze. A voice like the sound of many waters. Voice like the sound of many waters. Ezekiel 43 verse 1 says, He led me to the gate, the gate facing toward the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the way of the east, which is, by the way, the way Jesus will come from the east. The eastern gate in Jerusalem that is currently blocked up, currently closed. The Bible said it would be until he comes. It's funny because some of the Arabs and those who didn't want Jerusalem to be entered by Messiah closed it up. In fact, it was a Roman emperor, I believe it was Hadrian, who closed it up and said, this way their Messiah can't come through here, dumb. As if that would keep him from coming through. Jesus is going to come from the east. And Ezekiel 43 verse 2 says, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. Whose voice? God's voice. The sound of many waters. And, and John now says, that's what I heard. A voice like the sound of many waters. But listen, gang, I don't think it was like a gentle rain like what we're hearing right now. I would say imagine the sound of Niagara Falls. <laughs> Twelve million cubic feet of water going over Niagara Falls every minute. But what's interesting about Niagara Falls is though that's the way it ends, it's not how it begins. Niagara Falls as a river begins with a little trickle here. A little streamlet there, little babbling brooks that begin to come together and come together and come together to form this massive, raging river, this sound of many waters. And listen, if you're having trouble hearing God, if His voice seems silent to you, maybe instead of listening for the sound of many waters, you might want to start with a little stream. study there, a word here, a time of worship there. Sometimes we get frustrated because we don't hear the sound of many waters. God, I'm talking to you and I'm not hearing anything. And there's a tiny little verse that's the right place to start. Maybe just being with him in prayer is the right place to start. Revelation 21, 6, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. Revelation 22:17. the spirit and the bride say, come and let the one who hears come and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. So feet like burnished bronze, voice like the sound of many waters, right hand holding seven stars. Skip down to verse 20. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels, the angels. Of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. That makes perfect sense to you, I'm sure, so we'll just move on. <laughs> Day, verse 20 tells us that these are the angels, these seven stars, who are assigned to the churches locally, but also prophetically across the church age. Again, we will get to that next week as we start into the churches. But Jesus, Jesus holds in his right hand the protection of the church. What does that mean? When we've talked about how he is with us in tribulation. How does he hold the protection of the church in his right hand? Gang, no matter how badly man may have messed up the church in 2,000 years, Jesus still has the church. 
The church still belongs to Jesus. It is still the tool. Until we go home, it is still the tool of Christ in this world. It's still the tool through which He chooses to work. And so I may want to say, I'm done with the church. I'm fed up with church people. I don't want the whole church thing. I'm just going to go off. It's just going to be me and Jesus on our own. And Jesus goes, hey, <laughs> I still have the church. I'm still using the church. You can go off and do your thing, but this is what I'm using. And that may be hard to understand because, again, we look around at the church so often and we're just like, oh, man, you can see in the news, yeah, I was embarrassed too. Why do they do that? Why do we show these things? Why do we act this way? But Jesus still has the church in his right hand. He still protects the real church. And gang, the real church is not the Bridge Christian Fellowship. There's a handful of believers that are, for the most part, part of the real church. What do you mean for the most part? My heart is that every single person who is involved with the Bridge Fellowship, everyone will go home to be with the Lord. That's where my heart is. I don't know that that's what's going to happen. Only God knows that. The church is both larger and smaller than what we think. Larger because there are going to be more people in heaven that surprise us. You're here. <laughs> All right. No, no, I don't mean that's great. I'm glad you know. I just didn't think. I mean, I didn't know. But hey, great. <laughs> Meanwhile, the other person's looking at you thinking the same thing. How did you get here, man? <laughs> It's greater, it's larger than we think, it's also smaller than we think. He's not here. She's, where is she? Still there. The church. Jesus protects the church. Who is the church? It's those who believe God. Those who live by faith, not by perfection, not by works, not by doing all the right things, but who live in the grace of the Father, believing the Father to deliver. If you believe with your heart, confess with your mouth, you will be saved. You are protected. You're in the right hand. The right hand holding the seven stars. A mouth projecting a sword. There's a strange thought. Was there a sword shooting out of Jesus' mouth? No. John is giving us a powerful word picture. A word picture we probably should know. The sword is the word of God. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Mouth projecting a sword. What do you mean? Speaking the word. The word of God. What we are reading, gang, in the book of Revelation is the word that divides, is the word that cuts deep. And it will cut deep. There will be times over the next weeks, months that we study this book where you're going to be cut, where you're going to feel surgical cut, and it may be for something going on in your own life. And I pray if that's the reality that God is doing something to heal you. It may be something that's going on in the life of someone that you love and you know, but you realize by the word, man, I have got to tell them about Jesus. I can't let it go because they are not walking with him or for him. The sword, the word of God, face, face shining like the sun in its strength. We're talking high noon here. John could hardly even look into the face of Jesus, but unlike the sun, unlike our sun, Jesus' glory, Jesus' light, it doesn't entropy. It doesn't fade. It doesn't burn out. But this face also doesn't burn with unrelenting judgment. But what do you mean? Listen to the designation of the face of God in Numbers 6.24. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. We talked about this this morning. It's the light of the Lord. He wants to bring everything in our lives to light, to be dealt with, to be worked out so that we can get clear of all this stuff. What the Hebrew writer calls the sin that so easily entangles us, God says, let's light it up so you can see what the sin is and walk away from it. And so John is looking at this brilliant face like the sun Shining in its strength, verse 17 then tells us, I love this, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. Like a dead man. John flatlined. I'm convinced of it. Others might say, well, he says like. No, I think he was dead. 
I think John went out. I'll come back to that. He placed his right hand on me saying, Do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one and I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore and have the keys of death and of Hades. By the way, powerful verse to give to anyone who wants to say the Alpha and the Omega is not God. In the Old Testament, God refers to himself clearly in several passages in Isaiah. I am the Alpha and the Omega. And to the cultist who might say, the Alpha and the Omega, well, well, that's God. Then you can point them right to this verse and say, well, this is interesting because Jesus says, I'm the first and the last. And they might say, well, that's still just God speaking. And I'm the living one, still God. And I'm the one who was dead. Oh, okay. <laughs> now we got a problem. Because this says that this Alpha and the Omega is alive but was once dead. I'm alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. Therefore, write the things which you've seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. Has anyone else seen this picture of Jesus before? And the answer is yes. Daniel chapter 10. In fact, you can go back and on your own compare the entire 10th chapter of Daniel to John's revelation. The comparisons are stunning. I'll read you a couple verses. Daniel 10 verse 8. So I was left alone, and I saw this great vision, yet no strength was left in me. For my natural color turned to a deathly pallor. I retained no strength. I heard the sound of his words. And as soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell into a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. Boom! Daniel went down. He saw this vision of Jesus. And he went out like a light. I think Daniel flatlined too. Why do you keep saying that, Rick? When John saw Jesus, he fell down like a dead man. Uh, Stephen saw Jesus in the moments before his death and fell asleep, was, died after his seeing Jesus. Daniel saw Jesus, fell down again like a dead man. And this is exactly what the Lord says will happen to anybody who sees him. They will die. No man can see me. God said to Moses, Exodus 33, verse 20, You cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. If you see me, you will die. And that's the idea. That's the point. To see Jesus and to die to ourselves. To die to our old ways. Die to our pain, our suffering, our doubts, our despair. Die to our human struggle with sin. Die to that old stuff. And live to Christ. 1 Peter 7.24 He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. So that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, the new things have come. And if you haven't already done so, I encourage you, don't even walk out the door before you die to yourself tonight. How do I do that, Rick? You turn to Jesus. You turn aside from your life and turn to Jesus. Don't wait. Do it tonight. How? I'm not sure. Talk to me afterwards. We'll work it out. It's very simple. Verse 20. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Think back to the temple articles. The things that were in the temple, temple the, the, the different pieces of furniture, seven different pieces of furniture. We referenced this last week. The golden lampstand is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 11, verse 2, and you can look this up on your own, but it talks about seven specific ministries of the Holy Spirit, including the Holy Spirit himself. He's part of the seven. Like the lampstand, which had a single shaft up the middle, and then six branches off of it that held the candles, but there would be seven candles across it. Same with the seven spirits before the throne. Are you tracking? That's the Holy Spirit. The lampstand in the tabernacle was a picture way back then, ahead of time, of the Holy Spirit. And how he would ignite the hearts of believers. How he would be the light of the world. Exodus 25, 37, make its lamps seven in number, and they shall mount its lamps so as to shed light on the space in front of it, six branches, again on either side of the main shaft, equaling seven. And Jesus said in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. 
You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. Jesus said in John 9, 5, While I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Indicating that once he's taken out of the world, the light of the world would be through, again, the church. The church. The intimate relationship between the Holy Spirit in the world today and the church. You cannot separate the two. They function together. The Spirit is what invigorates and enlivens and ignites the church. So that Jesus could say, Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. And here at the end of this chapter, and on into the next couple of chapters, Jesus is moving among the seven lampstands, which represent the seven churches, which represent the whole church. Jesus walking among the lampstands, that picture of the Holy Spirit, but also of the church, the Holy Spirit and the church together. This inseparable relationship between church and spirit. Listen to this, John Stott, in his book, The Spirit, the Church, and the World, his uh, commentary on the book of Acts. He said the following, Without the Holy Spirit, Christian discipleship would be inconceivable. Inconceivable. It would even be, he writes, impossible. There can be no life without the life giver. No understanding without the spirit of truth. No fellowship without the unity of the spirit. No Christ likeness of character apart from the spirit's fruit. And no effective witness without his power. As a body without breath is a corpse So the church without the spirit is dead. Some of you have attended a few of those places. The church without the spirit. You cannot. You cannot function as the church without the spirit. If you do, you're dead. Because the spirit is the life and the breath of the church. Which is why. Which is why. Make note of this. Consider this. Think about it. Which is why when the rapture happens and the church is pulled out, this world will go very dark because for the first time in 2,000 years, the Holy Spirit will go with the church. The Spirit will no longer be here convicting the world of sin and judgment and righteousness as John said he would. The Spirit will not be present in this world doing what he is doing right now in the church. Oh, he'll interact. You're going to see this. It's amazing. Through the entire tribulation, God is still, still trying to save people. The Spirit will still be active, but more like He was in Old Testament times through individuals as opposed to right now through the whole church body together. Which is why Paul writes, last verse, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6, You know what restrains Him now, talking about Antichrist. What restrains, what's holding back that ultimate tide of evil. You know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And when the spirit goes, when the church goes, the world will be left to the only possible conclusion which is going to be The wrath of God in that time called the tribulation. Gang, I am convinced of it. I'm watching these things. The day is fast approaching. Did you know that the Gaza Strip, (laughs) back to Gaza, the Gaza Strip is now being called by those in the region Hamastan because it is under the complete and total control of Hamas. The Palestinian Authority has now said, we wash our hands and feet of it. We have no control in the Gaza Strip. It is completely overrun by Hamas terrorists. And by the way, 24, I believe, out of 128 settlements of Palestinians in the West Bank are also, also controlled by Hamas. It is an ugly picture over there. An ugly place. And the day is coming. Are you ready for it? Have you died to yourself? Have you turned aside to look at Jesus and died? Maybe you did. Maybe years ago you did. Maybe you're at a place in your life right now where you haven't turned aside to look at Jesus in a long time. Tonight, he would say, would you pause for a few minutes? Would you please turn aside and look? Because I have a word for you. Let's pray. Father, amazing stuff. Oh, God. 
just to read chapter 1 of this book. To see Jesus in, in this glorified state, which is absolutely overwhelming. It, may, it makes me, Lord, go weak in the knees just to read the words. And we saw John just fall down like a dead man until Jesus lifted him back up. Jesus, we pause tonight to recognize that this is your glory. That this is you. That though you walk as Son of Man, you now bear the full weight of glory. That heavy, wonderful, fantastic, godly glory that belongs to you. And Jesus, we worship you for it. And we lift up your name. And we, Lord, want to be among those who right now we bow and bend the knee. And we proclaim, we confess with our tongues, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We know, Lord, a day is coming when all the world will confess that same thing. Some to everlasting life, others to everlasting judgment. And so, God, we pray because we know that day is, is hurtling toward us. We know that day could at any time be fast upon us. We pray that you will give us courage and conviction, like John, that we would fervently spread the word. That we talk about you and, and share even what we've talked about tonight. That some would show up at work tomorrow and go, wow, I saw Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you will begin to convict the hearts and minds and souls of people in this area like never before. Holy Spirit, that you will spread out and you will work through your churches. Through all the fellowships located here. That you will start to bust down these divisive walls. God, the spirit of division that I believe resides in this area, that you, were, that, that you will take him out. Remove him so that the church can be effective. And that you will remove from us all sense of haughtiness and arrogance and spiritual pride and remind us it is only by your spirit's power working through us that anybody ever hears the gospel. Not because of our clever words or strategies or programs. Just your spirit at work. Come spirit, work among us. And save this very lost world. Lord, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.